Thank you for subscribing to this channel. This is a reading part C practice video. The answer to the question, when disclosing distressing information to patients, staff must avoid, can be found in the paragraph. The answer is option C, any approach which leads to misunderstandings. The paragraph states that when delivering bad news, it is important to be clear and avoid confusion or ambiguity. Using overly simplistic language may lead to misunderstandings, but being too technical can also cause confusion. The passage advises that it is important to find a balance, to allow people to understand and feel the impact of the news, and then allow them to ask questions. Therefore, option A, the temptation to use simplistic language, is not entirely correct, as it may be necessary to use plain language to communicate effectively. Option B, directing their attention at family members, is also not correct, as involving family members in the discussion can be helpful. However, Option C, any approach which leads to misunderstandings, is the correct answer based on the advice provided in the paragraph. Let's look at the next question.
The purpose of the policy guidelines for general practitioners on asthma action plans is described in the given paragraph. Based on the information provided, the answer to the question is option B, to raise their awareness of the value of asthma action plans. The paragraph states that written asthma action plans are an integral part of asthma management and one of the most effective interventions available for asthma. The purpose of the guidelines is to remind general practitioners of the importance of developing a written asthma action plan with their patients and or carers. The guidelines are intended to raise their awareness of the value of asthma action plans and to emphasize that the process of developing a written asthma action plan should be a discussion of the person's individual asthma and its management. Therefore, option A, to write asthma action plans, is not entirely correct, as the guidelines aim to remind general practitioners of the importance of developing a written asthma action plan rather than direct them to write one. Option C, to direct their discussions with patients about asthma action plans, is also not entirely correct, as the guidelines aim to raise general practitioners' awareness of the importance of developing a written asthma action plan rather than direct their discussions. Let's look at the next question. The guidelines on chemical waste disposal stress the need for staff to ensure that all chemicals in use, in storage, or being prepared for disposal are fully labeled and described, and to notify the hospital's designated waste contractor via the help desk and complete an incident form if unidentifiable waste is discovered. Additionally, all empty containers previously containing chemicals for license disposal must be considered as hazardous waste until cleaned. Therefore, the correct answer is B. Ensure that any chemicals in the hospital are properly documented. Let's look at the next question.
This memo is reminding pharmacists about the rationale for documenting incidents and errors, the procedure for investigating incidents and errors, and the method for record keeping. The memo emphasizes the importance of following a risk management procedure and keeping comprehensive and detailed records of incidents and complaints, including the nature of the incident, actions taken, and any conclusions. The memo also notes that the record should be kept for three years due to the delayed nature of some forms of litigation. Therefore, the correct answer is A. The rationale for documenting incidents and errors. Option B. The procedure for investigating incidents and errors is partially correct as it is mentioned in the memo, but it is not the only point emphasized in the memo. The memo also stresses the importance of appropriate record-keeping and documentation of incidents, including the details of conversations with third parties, which makes option B too narrow to fully capture the purpose of the memo. Option C. The method for submitting incident and error reports is not mentioned in the memo. While it is important to report incidents and errors, the memo focuses more on the importance of record-keeping and documentation of incidents, rather than the specific method for submitting reports. Therefore, options B and C are incorrect because they do not fully capture the purpose of the memo. The point being made in this guideline about patients with multi-trauma is that, while spinal injuries are relatively uncommon in such patients, they can have serious consequences if undiagnosed and left untreated. However, prolonged immobilization and spinal precautions can lead to complications, and the efficacy of these interventions in reducing secondary neurological compromise is controversial. Therefore, it is recommended that patients in ICU undergo spinal evaluation by CT imaging and interpretation by a consultant radiologist within 24 hours of injury. If imaging is undertaken out of hours, it is acceptable to continue spinal precautions overnight and review imaging early the next day. So, the answer to the question would be A. Staff should make it a priority to rule out spinal injuries. B. Spinal injuries are missed in a small but growing number of cases. This option is incorrect because the passage states that spinal injuries are relatively uncommon in patients with multi-trauma, affecting only about 5% of adult patients and resulting in a spinal cord injury in less than 1% of cases. The passage does not suggest that the incidence of spinal injuries is increasing over time. C. There is evidence that immobilizing a patient with spinal injuries is helpful. This option is incorrect because the passage suggests that the prolonged application of spinal precautions and immobilization is associated with multiple complications, 
and the efficacy of these interventions in reducing secondary neurological compromise is controversial. Therefore, the guideline recommends that patients undergo spinal evaluation by CT imaging rather than immediately immobilizing them. The passage does not support the notion that immobilization is helpful in reducing complications or improving outcomes in patients with spinal injuries. The update tells medical professionals that bovine insulin preparations will be withdrawn due to limited availability of the active ingredient. Users of bovine insulin preparations will need to be changed to alternative, acceptable preparations. People using bovine insulin are likely to be older patients with long-standing diabetes and may have absolute insulin deficiency. The use of bovine insulin has been associated with the presence of insulin autoantibodies, which may impair the action of insulin. Porcine, human, or analog insulin may lower the glucose more than the same dose of bovine insulin, and insulin dose titration may be difficult and unpredictable. Therefore, medical professionals should be aware that users may experience difficulties when switching to alternatives. Therefore, the correct answer would be B. Users may experience difficulties when switching to alternatives. A. It is being withdrawn due to the risks associated with its long-term use. This option is incorrect because the memo states that bovine insulin preparations are being withdrawn due to limited availability of the active ingredient, not because of risks associated with its long-term use. C. Any side effects are more difficult to identify in older patients. This option is incorrect because the memo does not mention anything about side effects being more difficult to identify in older patients. Instead, it provides information on the risks associated with using bovine insulin, such as impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, as well as potential difficulties in switching to alternative insulin preparations.